Hello, everyone. Welcome or welcome back to The Dan Nessel Show. I'm your host, Dan Nessel. Everyone knows that I'm a fan of LinkedIn. It's got its problems. I mean, it's pretty crowded. It's often impossible to keep track of your feed. There are loads of mediocre or bad content mixed in with these beautiful gems of wisdom and so on and so forth. But I think most of us agree that the worst thing about LinkedIn is the platform abuse that we encounter every day at the hands of like annoying and unscrupulous people. Uh, Well, my guest today can't stand those people either because he is an expert in selling on LinkedIn and he knows how important it is to build relationships and community while at the same time persuading and selling. For a decade, he's been helping consultants and coaches to learn behaviors and psychology, not faceless automation, in order to succeed on LinkedIn and beyond. He's the founder of the LinkedIn Client Accelerator and head of growth for Entrepreneur Business Live, among many, many other things. Taekwondo master, fitness expert, the list goes on and on. I keep peeling back the onion and it's like, it's just getting lovelier and lovelier. Please welcome to the show, all the way from the UK, my friend, Richard Moore. Richard. It's good to see you. Thank you so much, Dan. Oh man, it's so nice to be here and nice to catch up with you again. And um, you know what? I love it when people do research and it's like, you know, <laughs> half, half the people I speak to, they never, never peel back these kind of layers. So uh, I know this will be good fun. Well, you know, just to be completely transparent here, my my version of research was like 25 minutes on LinkedIn, but I'll tell you, we spoke before, so I don't feel like, like I've really had to plumb too far into the depths of Richard yet. But, you know, I, I have said on the show before that, you know, research is, you know, some people's bag. Uh, it's not always mine, but I do like to know a little bit about somebody. And I do, I do at least the bare minimum before I have somebody on. Because really what I want to do is have a genuine level of curiosity and surprise when I speak to people. And I think, you know, that's what my guests value. It's what my listeners value. I hope that's what, I hope that's what my listeners value. But we're going to have a good, con- good time with the conversation. I'm really glad to, to see you. You know, we were, we were introduced by, by Tracy Phillips, who is just incredible, obviously. And I think that you've been, you're like one of maybe three or four of my guests who came through the Tracy, uh, the Tracy route and, you know, good people bring good people. And I think that is a, maybe almost a fundamental truism of how to operate on LinkedIn. Right. And that's kind of where, where you come from. And, and let me just turn it over to you because I've, I've talked enough. No, no, no. You've got a really good point in that. And I, I'm, and it's interesting that there's this vibe all the time about volume, volume, volume. And if I just keep having more numbers, then I'll get great results. And so much chasing of volume means we miss the depth. And it's that that gets the results. And some might call me old school by being so manual in, you know, the individuals, what's interesting to me. But certainly if you're going for higher ticket propositions, then, you know, isn't it reasonable to want to get into the weeds with people? And I think, you know, if Tracy being one example, but there, there are a multitude of, multitude of you where you spend a little bit of time every day tuning into that person. You have your call or DMs or whatever, rather than the cursory connection with, hey, I want to connect with like-minded piece of people in this strange uh, approach, which is that if I amass lots of connections, followers and so on, maybe that will just work out for me doing the work basically. But on the recognizing first and foremost, this is all a human sport. Yeah. By human sport, do you mean, do you mean sales or do you mean, uh, you know, connecting in general? All of it in general, absolutely. Sales is an extension of, of it. Sure. But it, it's the lot, all the business, it's a human sport, and, um, all of the warm up and the networking and the fact that you know what that person's not quite right but actually we'll we'll connect you with the next person and that works out and that kind of interaction is is yet to be surpassed by a long way by anything else i agree and you know obviously we that's when we we met first time we talked about that a little bit and it's you know it's it's the power of connection over the power of volume as you said you said depth over volume i'm i'm, I'm writing down little nuggets as we t- as we speak because you're, you're you're full of them and in a very good way thank you, know? you. <laughs> but uh, uh, i think you know I, I like that that it's a it's a human sport um that's a a great way to think about things but you you got there you know kind of almost the hard way in some ways i mean look i've been on the receiving end of some of those you know kind of people selling intangibles, events, connections, things like this. 
And especially in the early days of the internet in the 2000s, it must have been a heck of a game. And, and that's kind of where you got your start. So can you tell us a little about how you got into not only sales, but into working with consultants and in this kind of, in your worldview of depth over volume and, you know, how'd you get there and where's it, where has it taken you so far? Yeah, it's, it's a, it's a weird story. Cause I, I, you know, I didn't, I didn't grow up going, do you know what? I just, I've got to be in sales. That's it yeah, for me. I don't it, think it, that many people do. <laughs> I know. Honestly. And there was this, there's a saying, which is no one wants to be in sales to start with, but you kind of fall into it. And, and I wanted to be academic. So I was finishing my thesis for my master's, which by the way, is in history. It's nothing to do with business. And then, um, I was trying to get funding for my PhD. I wanted to be a lecturer and that was my plan, you know, and sit and write books and things. And I didn't get funding. And so I was like, well, I need a job. And literally the very first job I applied for, I got an interview for, I just took it. And I had no idea what I was even doing when I got the job. I genuinely mean that. I didn't know what I was getting myself in for. But I thought, oh, you know what? This will be fun. Hey, I'm going to be interacting with people and so on. And really what I was after was wear a suit work in London. That's kind of, that was the vibe I was after. This is a business that was doing internet marketing 20 years ago. So this is 20, this is 2002. And it was, it was, it was like, not only is it cold calling from a business that had no brand, but it was on a product where people were yet to culturally believe in it that much. And of course, I was, you know, I was approaching people who had a website because that was where we'd find these leads, if you like. But for some people who, who may not even been born yet at that point, uh, you know, I'm talking about a phone you press buttons on. What's a, that? I know Gosh. it's weird, right? You have to lift up the receiver kind of thing. There was a phone book. We had a fax machine, Dan. It was that kind of level. And it, it was like cold calling and and it wasn't my thing very shy introverted guy who wasn't very good socially at all but what i understood was that actually these scripts i was being told to read down the phone kind of had some nuggets in them but it wasn't that it wasn't what i was saying it was the way i was received that was the problem and this is where this point you've made here about depth started to come in i remember just spending time thinking like what what am i missing here and what it was is the deals that came through are the ones where the people liked me. And it was, it's, you might think it's common sense, but when you've never done it before, you don't think like that. And, and it's only when you start doing a few deals that you think the commonality here wasn't that they liked the product because plenty of people got it. But what it was is they, they, they liked me. And so I started leaning more into, well, what does it look like to not be a bit of a stalker and cringy, but actually just to be, you know, just to be like <laughs> a good guy and, and to not try and manipulate because their ability to detect that was always superior to my ability to deliver it. So instead, focus on like, what commonality have we got? And, and mm -hmm. not having nice long chats with someone who doesn't know you because they're like, get to the point. But at the same time, being amenable, agreeable, pleasant, less aggressive and pressure, you, you tend to find people like you a bit more. And that was the first seed of progress. And I started to do really well. And, and the reason why I did well, really, at the very beginning was work rate. I just yeah. worked my face off. I just didn't stop. When you're 22, you can run through walls and not sleep. So you just do that. And, and I eventually got there. But but that evolved over time to, you know, a number of roles which you can go into. And then after 10 years in the city, I, I left and started my own consulting business, mostly focusing back in on those in the corporate space and coaching them on what good selling looks like, knowing that the city in London, especially, is awash with companies that focus specifically on cold outreach. That's what they do. Yeah. So having done enough, uh, enough of it, I could just give them best practice. And it's the hacks that you learn through doing it 10,000 times that I was giving people that would, you know, shave off months of their learning as a grad or, or as, you know, as someone who's trying to get to the next level. But then that evolved through me helping people online because I loved helping those with full, like so much energy as they start their businesses, get their first deal in a world where people are trying to make noise, understand Facebook back in 2014, 2015, and saying things like, well, maybe if I just do content, people will start liking me more. I yeah. was the guy that was going in saying, yeah, but here's how we start converting from the person who looked at you. And then 2018, I pivoted out. Well, I wasn't pivoted out. I added, if you like, LinkedIn uh, in earnest. 
And now it's like we're looking at four years that I've been doing this content play. And now we've, we've gone full circle. And although I still help people with their cold outreach, it's all warm inbound through understanding how the marketing thing dovetails with good selling practice and not putting people under pressure. So it's been a long time, but this is an evolution. I hope you can see that. Sure. That's gone from this very raw, in-your-face sledgehammer approach to something I'd like to hope is a, a bit more elegant. Yeah, you know, some part of that is because the buyers have evolved in that they've taken far more control over who they want to and, and want to listen to, who they who they buy from. There's a lot more choice on the market now. You know, even 2000, it was still, it was like 20 years ago where you're actually pushing buttons on an old phone. My goodness. <laughs> it wasn't a rotary phone, but it was no, close. No, we're, we're still a little <laughs> beyond rotary. They did have headsets back then. I will, I will vouch for that. They did, they did. But I was in a similar position uh, back in the late 90s, early 2000s, you know, doing some recruitment and cold calling and not my cup of tea. I mean, I will just, just put it out to my, my listeners know. I just, I've steered away from that. I really was much more about the depth part of it. And I always had difficulty, you know, with the, this, when do you, when can you feel comfortable enough to introduce the idea that, hey, you know what, I actually want you to buy something from me. And um, that's a very broad topic. And that's something that you've actually centered your career on in a lot of ways. You know, that's, that seems to be the focus of, um, of the LinkedIn um, client accelerator. Now, that said, I, I want to touch back on something you said, which is really interesting, that here you are, you know, fresh out of, out of school, you know, pursuing a path that you didn't envision because, you know, you wanted to be a, a lecturer and you wanted to, to be in academia. And I know that you are, you have, out, you have been able to achieve that dream in some ways because you do lecture at universities now, which is wonderful. And we can talk about that later as well. But, you know, we can always get to where we want to go. It just may not be the timing that we're, we're, we're looking for that. So that said, going back to, you know, when you first got out, you said that you were shy and introverted and look, there've been so many studies and, uh, personality assessments, uh, professional assessments out there for now 20 years talking about introverts, extroverts, all this kind of stuff. I mean, there's the, the classic Myers-Briggs formulation. Um, and I know that it introvert isn't exactly what we were taught when we were children. It's not somebody who sits around, sits at home and is unable to cope with the external world. Yes. But it's, you know, there's, there's certain kind of things about it. Yet being an introvert and being, and having to sit there and cold call all the time almost sounds like a unique form of torture. So yeah. how did you shift your mind? Like, how did you get over that? Because this is an interesting part of your evolution as a professional. Yeah, uh, so it's a really good point. And, and, and my understanding is more along the lines of where you get your energy, you know, and I get my energy or I've got my energy. I, I class myself more as an omnivert now, if there is such a thing. But my I get my energy back then. I got it through being, you know, with myself. I, I felt that was very refreshing and I recharged battery as well. There's a couple of things here. Um, first up, it was an upbringing thing. Um, my mum was very much the stoic. And her approach was always when you commit to do something, you're not you don't get to quit. And so she famously said to me when I was still at university, just so you know, you're not coming home, you realize you so you need. And so there's me as I hand. I remember I handed in my thesis a little earlier. So I about a week early so I could start this job. And Dan, I was sleeping on my sister's sofa for like two weeks trying to find a flat. I could have gone home. But like my mom was like, no. That's not how it works now. You, your move is progress is important. And so this was, a, this was a woman who always pushed us to never quit. And it's a huge gift she gave me. I'm very thankful to her. It's weird, you know, arguably it sets you up for a fall. Arguably it gives you pressure. But she, was, she's not, she wasn't the type to say things like, do your best. She would say, be the best, which creates a lot of pressure. But it also, it also drives excellence. And it was this, this kind of, tone of like, well, I, it's not about if you feel that this is a bit scary, that's, that's what it is. You're doing it, push through. And, and, and I think one of the things I learned from that, uh, kind of rhetoric, if you like, is that if we place in front of good things that can develop us, how we feel emotionally 
we often decide not to do those good things that can develop us because we, we decide instead to stay in our box. And so that I found that was very, very valuable. But the other thing as well was that, um, you know, I, I was in this role where like I, I with my mindset being one, I was not going to go, go and quit on this. I was like, well, I need to do well here. What's helped me in the past? And if I look at my academic studies in the previous years, I'd done really, well, here in the, U, in the UK, we have a big set of exams when you're 16 called GCSEs. I'd aced a lot. Then I went to A-levels, which is when you go to 18 and we get three big subjects you focus on. And I'd flunked them all. And the reason I flunked them all and got in my head and was like, I was, I had to leave one of the exams because I was going to throw up because I was so nervous because I, I was in my head worrying with nerves about if I'd pass or not and put myself under pressure. And when I went to university, I remember one of my tutors saying, look, here's how you calm yourself down. And it's for the first time ever when I was 20, I had this woman talking to me about mindset and how to control myself and so on. And I remember it was at the end of that first year, I came top of the year for my subject purely because she showed me how to believe in myself and take on an exam properly as opposed, you know, I, I never could not do it. It's just the setting. But what that enabled me to do was step into my, my, when I did my second degree, I found myself putting my hand up and saying, do you know what? I'll represent the subject at what, like, what we call the Senate, which is like this kind of um, government body within the university, if you like. And I'll, I'll chair that. I'll be president of that. And I could feel myself going, you know what? You can really reinvent yourself. And inside me, there was still this voice screaming, oh, my goodness. But what if, what if this doesn't work? What if that doesn't work? But I found there was this strange, um, there's a very close line between massive amounts of fear and exhilaration. And it physiologically feels very similar. And I just seemed to get, I kind of became a bit of a junkie for, for throwing myself at hard stuff. I don't know what it was. And so, as I said, it was a very weird dichotomy. There's this part of me that I was kind of breaking out of a bit that was just fearful and scared and hadn't really left, you know, I'd not left my original town that I grew up, grew up in much and, and so on. And then there was this other person that was like, come on, let's go get it. And that worked really well just by being bold. And, and so there was a lot of, when I got on the phone, there was a lot of being a person. And then when the phone and when the headset went down, it was re- it was a reversion to who I like who I was. So I was kind of emerging or some kind of a metamorphosis there, if you like. And I was switching it on and off when it was needed. But just to be really clear, like I would get home exhausted mentally. I, and I was like, it was like I <laughs> I had like this kind of aftershock of like, man, this is really scary what I'm doing. But it was also, you know, you're getting commission and things. So it's kind of kind of fun. Well, sure. I mean, you're, you're rewarded for that. Um, and that's we can't we can't underestimate the importance of earning your, your yes. keep. But th- it's interesting that you're talking about this. So first of all, there's so much to unpack. You were talking about your, you know, being pushed or understand making making that mindset shift so that you're comfortable so that you decide to be comfortable with discomfort so that you are able to to look outside of your comfort zone and that's where you decide that that's where you want to go rather than staying in the safe place and we've all been there and we've all uh you know been in places where you know uh I'm I'm just going to take the safe route and I'm I'm going to be comfortable here and I think men, the vast majority of people probably stay that way um and you know, once you decide to make that move out of your comfort zone, it is exhilarating. It's fearful. You're right. It's very good. Those feelings are very close to one another. Mm. But doing it once doesn't mean that you're going to continue to do it. I mean, you have to. It you have to work at this, right? Yeah. And because extending your comfort zone and then moving into the new into a new kind of place gives you just a different comfort zone. So then you're yeah. you're faced with the same conundrum again. And and yeah. it seems like you have just been consistently looking at this as okay. I'm at the boundary. What's beyond that boundary that looks good? I'm going to make this mindful decision to go for it. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of that, I think, requires a, almost like you're laughing at fear. I mean, you have to kind of make this conscious decision to say, well, you know, I, I'm I'm going to understand that 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 failure is possible and probable, but I'm going to do it anyway. And that takes a certain kind of person. I think... There was also luckily some returns. I say luckily because some of it was fluke, but the, part of this was curiosity. But yeah, I mean, I got a deal in my first week, I remember, 1,700 euros it was on the Friday, and I'd start it on the Monday. And I remember everyone was like, 
no one does that. And I remember I did, I remember I did 10, uh, like, no, it was 20 K in that quarter. And I remember I hit all these accelerators and that. And so it was like more money than I'd ever experienced before. And everyone was like, what's going on? And all it was, was that I was just like, did not allow myself to think. And, and far before years before I had realized what I was tapping into as well was the reality that time is the fuel of fear. And well, that, that's why if people stop and think, they they talk themselves out of things. It's a, and I've become this ready fire aim person, or even fire aim forget ready bit. And I know that that people might say, yeah, but you're not planning. That's not clever. But what it is is you can tune into and and develop and evolve your ability to work in the moment. I'm not perfect, but what I can do is work in the moment and rely on intuition. And that intuition grows. It's a muscle you can work, you know. And by throwing myself at stuff and working out as I go, which is how I've built my business, to be honest. There's no there's no coaching degree. There's no business background. There's being on the pitch a lot and figuring out as I go and kind of winging it a bit. And then after a while, you're like, that bit worked, so I do well. But all this culminated in getting results. And so it, it naturally made me go, well, do you know what? That's that seems to be working. But remember as well, there's those echoes of, of my mum saying, like, go be the best. Also, it's worth the context adding, I've got a sister, one's older, one's younger. My older sister went to Oxford, straight A's, straight into the city, exceedingly high-end job and, and only a winning all the way. So I had like those foot shoes to fill as well. And, I, you know, I didn't have the shoes to fill, but I, I you know, that... Yeah, it felt that way. That the echoes of my past. It was it was weirdly um, a, a fondness and respect and love for my sister, but also this healthy competition. It's like it's not like I was trying to beat her, but I wanted to, you know, show that I'm at a level as well. So it's an interesting thing that I was. I've always been competitive with myself, I think, and so all of these things have contributed to diminishing that voice. And jumping and not in a lot. If I'd given too much time and thought too much, I could have certainly took myself out of all of this. Um, and time passes quick and you, you find yourself like suddenly 18 months in, it's like, hey, what about a promotion? You, why don't you run a team, Richard? And then it's like, what about this? And, and the virtual conferences in 20, 2007, I remember the managing director called me in and said, he, literally his words were, we need someone who's going to grab this by the scruff of the neck. We want it to be you. And I was like, all right, let's go for it. It's just because I wasn't stopping and thinking too much. I was running through walls as we tend to do when we're in our twenties, it seems. Yeah, of course. That's an interesting, uh, also another interesting thing you bring up. Uh, and, and I keep writing things down to, to talk about now that, you know, I, I don't know where to go. I, I But in this particular, um, what you just said there, when you were promoted to, or when you're asked to take on a, a, a management role and leading a team, and you just, uh, without thinking, just went went for it. Did you now find, once you got into that leadership role, that you were better as a salesperson, or did you, or did you find that you really gravitated naturally to a leadership role, or was there a combination? Because, you know, a lot of salespeople, this happens to a lot of companies, they promote the best salespeople to be managers, and then wonder why the sales the sales uh, sales teams fail after that. So, what was your experience with that? That's a, such a good observation, and it's a really good tip for any sales people listening out there, or rather sales directors who think that promoting someone who's good at selling will be making a good manager. In the same way as great people at football don't necessarily make great football managers. Uh, and and you're totally right. I was good at the selling. I got it, and I could deliver. Was I the best in the company? I really wasn't. I, I wasn't. I was always in, let's say, the top quarter of all performers, though. And I think what they saw was a good leader um, because of my energy. Um, but but yeah, it does. Teaching makes you a better student without question. And, you know, it's in my blood to learn. My Both my parents were teachers. Uh, I, I wanted academia to run through my veins. You can see behind me, I've got books everywhere, much like yourself. There's always learning. And, and if you look at the thread, actually, all the sales leadership roles were training salespeople. Now I train in a different way. I was training children and adults in Taekwondo. Whatever it is, there's always that teaching. But also... I respect highly, because I do it myself, those who are also practitioners. It's so easy to read a book and just talk, but it's so much better, I believe, to do it and be on the pitch with them and say, here's how it works. 
And by the way, here's me doing it not once upon a time, but literally right now, right now, you know, and the, all, of, all of the instances of teaching, I, 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 re- I remember that they leveled up my personal gain, but I also, there was this feedback loop of me thinking, how do I ever get respect from people? And certainly it started my first ever sales role, sales management role was, well, I better keep closing sales because how can I, no one listens to you if you can't close sales. So that was important too. Yeah, there's a big difference between earned authority and delegated authority or given authority. And and um, that's one thing I think that, you know, I've learned over the course of my career, my life as well. I have been placed into situations where, you know, having been an academic high achiever, having been a, a teacher as well uh, as in my early days uh, and being able to, in my case, I was in Japan at this time, early 2000s or early, sorry, 90s and early 2000s. And um, towards the end of the 90s, uh, I moved out of teaching in, into recruitment and I wasn't a great recruiter. I mean, I really wasn't. I was I was a good relationship builder and a really good networker, but I got really you know, excited about meeting this person, understanding they're connected to this person. Oh my gosh, what great things they've done, but not taking it to the next step where all right, I'm going to place this person in a role or, or I'm going to bring a candidate to this person. Like there was a disconnect for me. I was much more excited about who this person was and what the cool things that they do and the people that they know rather than the business that I can conduct with them, right? So I, I kept going in that direction. And then, you know, like I said, I wasn't that great at it, but I had one big thing going for me in Japan, which is that I could speak Japanese, right? So my first recruitment job, you know, so I, I left that company um, and then I was, I was recruited by another, by a startup who, you know, I guess by virtue of me being a very good interview said, oh gosh, you're the guy we're looking for. Uh, You know, why don't you start up our recruitment team? And here I was a, a mediocre at best recruiter who understood systems. And I mean, I understood the way it worked. You know, you, I could, I could talk the talk for a good, you know, why, but I wasn't a, an exemplary person. So when I started to build a sales team and run the sales team, you know, I didn't have that authority based on the fact that I had been a hell of a recruiter or that I'd been a successful businessman. Now, later in my career, you know, uh, and and by the way, I got that job really because I could speak Japanese and not because I could sell or knew that or understood that part of the business. So that, you know, that's another lesson to learn there. But, you know, later in my career, of course, like as I drifted into writing, editing, and then into marketing communications, you know, 20 years of marketing and 20 years of communications under my belt. I am confident in my skills and I am able to roll my hand, roll my sleeves up and, you know, write anything from a basic post all the way up through a byline article or whatever. And my team knows that they know that I can do the work. They know that I have an eye. So when I lead people, I have some credibility. I have a lot of credibility that I wouldn't have had, you know, earlier. So anyway, it's just, this a long way of saying that, you know, leading with credibility is far, far more effective than leading with just because of, uh, of assigned authority. Well, I actually experienced very, something very similar because in 2010, I think it was, uh, I was headhunted into a recruitment business. And um, I remember my first role was leading a team. There was only like three of them and I remember on day one, the look on their face, they didn't need to say a word. The look on their face was, you're the guy who's our new manager, the one who's never done recruitment in their life. Did we work for the same recruitment firm? It's yeah, honestly, and no, but this is the thing. It was, it was like, we just want a guy who's good at selling. And I was like, I don't know what the process is. I, I had no idea these terms, contingent and perm, I, or, or like retain. I didn't know what that meant. So I remember it was like, I don't win this team. I can say stuff, but I could, f- you can feel it. I was like, I don't win them unless I get a deal. So I remember I closed a retainer within like two weeks and, and they were like, oh, okay. Then I was like, yeah, because it's selling and selling is selling because it's people wherever you go. And they're like, and then they just paid attention. I was like, because they'd never done a retainer there. That's not what they did. So I said like, there's 5,000 quid. Let's start this job. And they were like, okay, we're going to pay attention now. So it just, I, I remember feeling it feeling it and, and and what I was doing when I was like those first months I would stay on late and and like close a deal or do a placement do just so I could look 
so I could be ahead when they came in in the morning. Because otherwise, I, I was like, I was behind. I didn't know what I was doing. I had to kind of figure it out. But um, yeah, it's, it's so crucial to do that. And I urge everyone to always, always be a practitioner as well as uh, if they're going to be a teacher. And and that sort of is a good way to kind of glide into what I wanted to ask you. So you were your practitioner, you, you went into, you know, you, you sold events, you sold these intangibles, like I mentioned earlier, you then sold people. I mean, you know, let's face it, that's what recruitment's about. That's right. And moving from there towards this, like flipping the script a little bit where you were then selling, selling, right? It seems like you yeah. kept getting progressively meta in your career. I don't know, but I know it is so meta now. I mean, it, I mean, if you if you jump to now, I sell people on how they were sold <laughs> on LinkedIn. You know, yeah, I'm like so the people who the people who joined this week. I remember I say it to their face. It's like you've gone through a process you don't even realize has happened. And when you join in, I loop us back to the start and show you how you were sold. And it's funny because people are like, ah, oh, I remember you made me feel like that at that point when you said that thing. I'm like, yep. And now here's how you do it. So I love, I love that it's, it, like I say, it's very, very meta. And, um, but, but you know, the pivot is interesting because when I, when I moved out of the city, it, it was tough. It was like my, my wife, who was a lawyer at the time, also in, in, in London, um, she's, she just stopped work because we just had our, our first daughter born. And so, so some people were like, you're being really irresponsible, Richard. Like, wh- where's the money coming from? But firstly, she believed in me, but also I believed in myself. I was like, if there's one thing I can do, I can sell. So let's just start. And that's where the taekwondo came in because I'd been doing taekwondo since 1999. And so this is like 2012, 13 or whatever it was. And I, I, I started two taekwondo academies. And when you go from cold calling CEOs to close deals with them to selling like mums and dads on little Johnny, the eight-year-olds joining your 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 um, taekwondo school. It's quite straightforward. I would imagine. Yeah. <laughs> so it was really pleasant. But what's interesting is that in that in those moments, those early days, it was like taekwondo was the device, but I really loved like the Facebook game, like getting people around the attraction side. Because remember the thing I was selling originally was internet marketing. So everything from banner ads and SEO to how people present themselves, but all the way through it was what language, what phraseology, what feelings get people to to kind of be compelled to act in some way. So Facebook it was my first dabbling in social media. As someone who just didn't know what he was doing with it, I was like, just post every day. Let's see where it goes. And what I found very quickly was that Taekwondo was just a, it was a hobby come business, but actually the thing I loved the most was building the business and doing like the marketing in it and the selling. And that's where I started. I went straight to like, do you know what, on the side, I'm going to start helping people close their sales and, you know, and, and I, I sold them. I literally had a zoom, zoom, um, PayPal and Facebook, all the free accounts, found them on Facebook engaged with them on the DMs, got them onto Zoom, closed them for consulting for an hour a week for a month and and ran that through PayPal. And I was like, let me show you what I did with you. And the the best thing is they have to believe you that it works because they just bought it themselves. So like, well, okay, whatever you did to me, I want to hear. And so, and what happened was, uh, you know, the the Taekwondo became a thing I ran. And then 2018, I was like, I just... I'm going to stop this now. I'm going to park this because of Entrepreneur Business Live, which is another stream. But it was really interesting that I, w- I just I just kind of it really enjoyed that so much. And I was like, wow, this is so much more straightforward because now I'm bolting on attraction, whereas originally I was chasing. And now they're coming to me. I'm like, I can't miss. And obviously you can, but like, I can't miss by comparison when I have people going, hey, that's a really good point. I'm like, are you kidding? <laughs> this never happened in the past. <laughs> Normally it's, oh no, don't worry about that. And they hang up the phone on you. So it's this new world. And so I was just like, I hoovered up as much as I could on on what internet marketing looks like properly and yeah. the copywriting side and so on. And that became Instagram 2016, LinkedIn 2018. And um uh, yeah. And so it's been it's been a really interesting evolution and really gone through the whole process of this fusion. Again, we're back on that point of marketing and sales altogether. Sounds like the Taekwondo. I mean, obviously, it was something that you did. You could show results and, you know, martial arts in general. 
I don't think there's an argument out there anywhere that says it's a it's bad for anybody. You know, I mean, it's is generally seen as a good thing. And you know, so you had, I suppose that's what you mean by something that was an attractor, people just coming to you because, and it was, you know, you're not you're not selling, um, you know, coal mining services. You're selling, you know, something that's clearly a common good. But also I had leverage. If I think about it, I'd been doing it like getting on for 15 years by then. So I was good and I'd won medals and stuff. So I, I was like, yeah. the, the local competition wasn't so much to worry about. And it's interesting that you just looked at that as you, like you were, you were interested in your business. Clearly you're, you're passionate about teaching the kids and, and uh, continuing your Taekwondo practice, but what thrilled you was the marketing side and just figuring out how all this stuff works. Did you keep track of everything in journals or in a, in a database or did you write down your processes? Like how did you build this process that you eventually came to? Because as obviously as we're, as we're talking about it, it just sounds like, oh, you know, like, like it came to you and you could do it. <laughs> it's like I had this big plan. But it, there's a lot of optimization, right? Yeah. Yeah. It does sound like it was like, well, that's the le- logical step. It's weird how it like these logical steps were just they happened it wasn't like it's intelligent now for me to do this thing it just kind of it it all feels very neat doesn't it um not really you know i mean there are some journals i i keep everything i'm not this hoarder but i keep that kind of stuff so there are journals where i i like i would write my notes on courses i was taking uh to kind of help me through and and understand things but i've but all of like the linkedin pages and groups and stuff like that i've kept it all like it's all like uh, unlisted or whatever on private, but I can still access that. So I can see like how that all grew. And I'm, I'm a big believer in looking at where you've come from and seeing how your evolution has kind of uh, grown to, to kind of get some cues on where you might go next as well. Uh, so yeah, I, it's an interesting one. I, I just have this I have this keenness to be doing and creating. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not a good TV watcher, Dan, because I, I don't like spectating. And it might seem like I'm, I'm not interested in others. Of course I am. And the community matters to me and so on. But I like doing and I like being creative and I like being on the pitch. And and because it's something that I enjoy, I I kind of tend to remember every little detail. I have this weird brain. I can remember all the all the deals I've done and all the little things people said and things like that. But I suppose it's because I genuinely am into people. That's and that's kind of the core of it all. And I mean, that's that's the way you started the conversation. It's about that depth, that connection with people. But still, there's a process involved. I mean, you you're you're your success or the way that you help people be successful is by introducing them to a process, explaining how they've just been subject to the process. But this process, how long did it take you to develop that? I guess is kind of what I wanted to figure out. And I hate using that word like some people because it's so unscientific, but, but let's just face it. There are folks out there who are getting pitched on LinkedIn all the time um, with these, I'm going to teach you how to, you know, increase your sales by X percent, or I've, I'm the lead generation guy, or I'm the this guy, or I'm the that guy. And I think a large number of those, of the folks on the other side of that, you know, of the purported salespeople who are sending those messages out have either no method or have, you know, learned something in a day or two, or, or just, it's some kind of, there's no depth to it. There's no, it's just what you're seeing on the surface. And maybe they've got a couple of tools, who knows? But you've built this over years. And, you know, clearly there is, there's a, an optimization process that has happened to get you where you are. Right? So I just want to make, make it clear and, or at least ask you to, to talk about that just a little bit, because yeah. like, it can't be as easy as I'm going to send you a DM or I'm going to call you. Right. And then, and then I'm just going to see if you're interested. And if you're not interested, I'm just going to move on right? It can't be that simple. No. Yeah. There's more to yeah, it. Yeah. You've got a really good point. And so this is a big one for if people who are taking notes here. It's about the optimization process and what it looks like. So why did I get better at selling? Because it was so intense. I was doing it over and over again, all day, every single day, no other function. I wasn't doing admin. Someone else did that. I didn't do marketing. Someone else did that. I was literally standing on a phone all day, every day. And so I got good at this thing because it's all I did, like when you do anything else. Sales management required me to constantly be around the desk, listening in, taking over calls, explaining to people 
all day, every day. And so what I'm always looking for is, is because the thing is, yeah, we like hacks, but you cannot beat the hard experience. So when we look at what I was doing online, for instance, very early on, so 2015, I did my first uh, live stream. 15 or 2016, I started this thing called Startup Business Q&A. And every Monday at 1 p.m. UK time, I went live, originally just on Facebook. Then it added YouTube and Instagram and LinkedIn uh, when I got that feature as well. Um, I would go live and answer questions for one hour. And I knew the answers to the questions, or at least I knew Richard's answer to the question on session number one. But what happens is every time you answer the same question, because there's only like 15 questions in the world, it seems, and everyone keeps asking the variations of the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> but what's interesting is that after a while, that the term I've always used is that you hone your philosophy. And so what's interesting is people say, well, you're so you nailed that answer so well. It's like, yeah, when you get asked 35 times, you get quite good at answering stuff. So I did that live show consistently every week for 260 weeks. So I did five years of it. And so by the end, I'd literally answered thousands of questions, but mostly against like, what do you do in the DMs, Richard? Or like, how do you close, Richard? And, I, and so so with a bit of context, but it was like, it was the similar kind of answers. And so the, the commonality here is by doing a lot all the time, it does optimize. And it's like, yeah, I was, if I look at back, if I look back at a video that I did, for instance, in 2016, right now, on a topic that I might still talk about, such as conversion from a post or I don't know, whatever it might be, I will loosely agree with what I'm saying. I've got the right idea, but the delivery might be different now. It would be better. It's more evolved and it's a little bit more polished. And I think that's what it comes down to. And by doing, again, by what I never did was get off the train and say, I'm done now. That's my that's my time. I'm just going to be the 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 preacher from now on. By being in in like on the pitch still, it means I can say, here's current best practice. And like you said at the top of this session, Dan, people evolve in how they buy and so on, and, and they evolve in how they sell too. And so we need to keep a pace of it. So, but but it's it's constantly smoothing the edges by by talking, by doing it over and over again. And my my world every day is discussing things like an interview such as this is one of scores of interviews I've done to talk about possibly similar themes. And so every time you do it, there's a bit in your brain that gets a little bit better at articulating it. And as you do it, if you genuinely are into it, as I am, you tend to have that part of your brain stewing away in the background going, do you know what? Here's a better few steps to take you through. And so it seems so well delivered, perhaps, these methods or systems I might teach, but it's based on just the experience and testing and testing and testing. Some of that's conscious, but a lot of it is just by trial and error and letting the subconscious work the rest out, you know? And I, I love that organic way of, of building something that works well, rather than, in my opinion, the mistake of saying, well, wait, let's get some paper out and let's just put down, you know, let's go on conjecture and let's let's try and s simulate what would happen and work it all out. And I'm not as much a believer in that. Yeah, I, I can see that for sure. I, your upbringing with your stoic mom, in your words. Yes. But some would say a, a mom who truly truly and deeply cared and loved about her loved her children loves loved her children and um certainly you know wanted to position you to be independent thinkers and on your own right so that you have your and then you have your siblings and your sibling rivalry rivalry slash sibling situation and then um your you know your experiences with with your own academic career you know it's a constant mindset that is it's a mindset that is constantly attuned to optimization opportunities, it seems to me, right? And you, you mentioned a couple of things that were really interesting to me. Um, creativity is one of those things. And we'll, let's, let's get back to that in a second. Um, but this whole idea of repetition, doing it again and again and again and again, we always hear and we don't want to hear, but we always hear that there are no shortcuts. Some people get lucky, that's for sure. But luck is not something that that we can either count on nor may it be real. I mean, luck is generated by the conditions that you create, uh, most likely. Um, I'm not going to discount spirituality or universalism or any of that kind of stuff. That's not what I'm here to do. Uh, 
But I will say that that in general, let's say that you create the conditions within which you either fail or succeed. And, you know, your mindset at those times is 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 really what's going to make the difference. But this whole idea of no shortcuts, I think I want to make that clear. Like your 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 LinkedIn profile, for example, is very focused on improving performance for your clients and for salespeople on LinkedIn. People see sales on LinkedIn, they think, okay, this guy's going to give us some hacks. It doesn't sound like that's what you do. Yes. Yeah, so people like a process because a process is something they can hold on to. So the two things I really help people with aren't hacks, it's process or a system, steps that you can follow that work combined with awareness of blind spots. So when you're learning something, you can't, you can't kind of cut corners on the experience that's needed, but you can learn about the blind spots. So a really good example, if you use Taekwondo, right? So part of Taekwondo, when you get to, when you get higher up, you do a thing called destruction, which is breaking boards with your fists or your feet or whatever. And um, there's a process and to the untrained eye, you hit it with your hand in loosely in a fist. But when you learn that there's some little nuances here and there, the blind spots, you could call them hacks, but really they are the blind spots. Don't do it this way because that's how you break your finger. And I, you know, I've broken a, a bone here before on, on the side of my hand because I hit the board wrong. But when you learn the blind spots, it doesn't mean you suddenly break every board. You may well break every board, but you get better or more efficient at breaking the same boards um, with the experience. That's the thing. Yeah. And so uh, the other side, my, I remember my instructor would help me so much with my sparring and he'd tell me about things that were tells or cues. And again, you could argue they're hacks, but it was blind spots. It's like, you don't know that you don't know this part because you didn't realize it existed. But when someone does that with the back of their foot, that means they're about to spin around and do a kick. And you're like, oh, how did I not see this? And it's the same with LinkedIn and with the cues around conversion as well. But you're still not going to be any good unless you go and get kicked in the face a few times because you need to have that experience too. There's a big difference between hacks and what you're talking about. I, I agree. So a hack to me sounds like, okay, I'm going to read, I'm going to read three sentences and suddenly I'm going to be able to make a massive change in my life and everything's going to be different. Yes. That is a, a hack that is completely unrealistic. Then there's the hack like like if you bend a paperclip a certain way and put it on your on your desk, you can balance a pencil on it. Okay, that's a great life hack. That's no problem, right? That's that I understand. <laughs> the yeah. difference is that you can see the why, right? If you understand if you can get to the why of it and get to the understand the rationale for for the advice, then it's it's not a hack, it then becomes an aid or a tool, right? It, it's a little bit different. Um, I, I hope I'm getting that across clearly. But in the in the world of LinkedIn and sales, and let's let's kind of turn there for a minute, the environment has changed just so much. I mean, even in the last few years, clearly, because of what we've been through with uh, changes to the business landscape, changes to the work landscape, a, a dramatic increase in uh, side hustles slash uh, entrepreneurial adventures, um, forced or unforced. And LinkedIn has been the platform of choice for, for building businesses. So it's also been the platform of choice for nefarious people or for people who are, who are trying to make a buck quick and, and employing hacks that may or may not work. Trouble with LinkedIn is that when you, when you think you've got the hacks right and you think you've got this kind of immediate secret formula, then the temptation for many people is to spend whether that formula is write an email, write a message this way, and you're sure to get some responses, and then the next response should be this, and so on, right? Without understanding what you're doing, you start throwing these these ideas out there. You start throwing these emails out there. Sure, you're going to catch a couple of fish with a big net, but that net is going to kill a lot of other uh, marine life. Let's keep the metaphor going. So when you do that, eventually some people out there are going to go, oh crap, there's the the, the fish killer is coming. So you ruin your reputation. Let's get this where I'm going here is, how are you approaching the platform now? How have you seen it? I'm going to give you a kind of loaded, not loaded as in, as, in, as in biased question, but a full question. Like, how have you seen the platform evolve? And how have, for the good, for the better, for the worse, 
And how do you approach people now? And ha- like, with, without giving hacks away necessarily, like top line, what's the best way to connect with people? You know, when you first start, when you're first building your business on LinkedIn. Yeah, let's look at that first question because we all joined LinkedIn. You know what, 15 years ago, whatever, when it was essentially an online resume, uh, a Rolodex of sorts, and nothing else was was to it. Then, you know, Microsoft spend $26 billion and buys the thing. And, and in the last four years, it's become a content play. Um, they're about to launch podcasts. You know, they tried stories last year. They now have audio rooms to compete with Clubhouse, for instance. They're doing all of that. And so the landscape is, is definitely different. And I think we need to just remember momentarily that people have evolved in how they receive selling and uh, or you know how they buy as well purely through the fact they're conditioned now they know what it means when someone says hey you don't know me but here's this webinar or whatever and um, you know it's it's like we've got this condition response which is kind of hard hard wired in so it's changed so much and the way I describe this, if I go back to a couple of years to um some talks I did about LinkedIn when everyone was like really Really, what LinkedIn, when it was all Instagram or Facebook for your content marketing. Um, what was interesting, I said, I said, look, it's it's a sleeping giant because you won't get this anywhere else. You know, in more recent years, yes, TikTok has surged and so on. But but what you have with LinkedIn is everyone is there and everyone is already there. It's not a new platform. Senior decision makers were already there. Senior decision makers weren't on TikTok a year and a half ago. They're starting to get in there now. But what you had was this huge body of people sitting there with relative silence. You know, you could do a status update or whatever, but that was about it. And there's still relatively a tiny amount of noise on there. So what you have is this, the the best method, the way to visualize it is imagine a crowded theater, but with no one on stage. The crowded audience in that theatre is all of the people on LinkedIn using the platform every day. They have a news feed, but they don't really pay much attention. There's not really much going on on it. And it, and you can go and stand on the stage. And unlike Facebook, where you have to pay to play, you have a very generous algorithm because it's this combination of huge amounts of people on it using it and no noise. And I, the stats probably evolved somewhat. But if you look at about a year ago, it was 3 million bits of content in a, in a whole week. That was it. But 9 billion impressions. So your slice of the pie was so much bigger. And that leads into how I use the platform. And I, what, I, what I do often is issue people a challenge. I say, imagine it was banned co- uh, reaching to people out, like cold, completely cold, like you're not allowed at all. Imagine it was outlawed. What would attraction have to look like? And it starts with content. But what we've what we got to remember is people hate to be sold to. These are our truths, okay? People hate to be sold to, but they love to buy. Love to buy means they really, they're into you. They kind of fall in love with you somewhat. They think that you're worth something. And that's, that goes for a person or for a brand. People love to buy their next iPhone, despite them shedding $1,000 on it. The reason why they love to buy it is because they they are they're falling in love with the journey they're going to go through the 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 flex they'll have because they've got the new the new toy or whatever. So remembering that they love to buy means there is a process out there that as long as they're stepping in your direction, you can win by. So here's your big takeaway: when you produce content that stimulates, people gather around. Your content is your gravity, and when people gather around, they do a number of things and. Most people lurk in the background. They don't go, hey, I want to buy something now that I saw your content. It's exceedingly rare. But what they do often do is something small. They might vote in a poll. They might even go as far as comment or like your post. Or they might just, you might be leveraging what's known as the curiosity gap. They might just look at your profile. Who's this Dan guy? That was a really good post. I liked that. Who is Dan? They click on your profile. That for me is my first little seed. Rather than me chasing someone I don't know, hey, I found you on Sales Navigator. You look like you fit the bill. I'm going to target you with this message when you didn't ask for it. Instead, I've used content to get that person to go, that's stimulating. Who's this guy? Okay, move on. And my message to them will be, hey, Dan, I just saw you checked out my profile. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. 
just out of interest, did anything catch your eye? And the point is, rather than just saying thanks, I'm saying, was there anything that caught your eye? And one out of 10 might be like, yeah, actually, I, I, I thought it was really good. Or, or yes, I voted in the poll because I found it interesting. Just out of interest, what made you vote for that option? And now we've got a conversation. And people are very happy to have a conversation when they took the first step, when they voted in your poll, when they looked at your profile. And, and if you put out good content that stimulates and draws people in, you can't really miss because every day you've got a new crowd within which sit some people who probably find you quite stimulating. And as long as you keep consistent, you know, you can really do away with this cold outreach that they, they are conditioned to not want to receive. It doesn't mean it doesn't work, but they are far more happy to engage with someone who they consciously chose to engage with first. So that's where, it, that's the start point of my process now. It's hard to, uh, just to be to be completely honest, it's hard to hear or look at that process from the point of view of like a, a standard user on LinkedIn, because I'm not, yeah. right? I am, yeah. I'm a marketer and a communicator. I'm thinking, okay, that's a really nice tactic. And I can see tactically where you're going. Also, I've been on LinkedIn since 2003, like longer than the vast majority of people. And I've said this, I've said this several times on my podcast. I'll say it again, because I've decided I'm going to brag about it. Member number 65,000 something. That's what I am out of, out of whatever billions of people. It hasn't gotten me anything other than longevity and, you know, a couple of emails back in the day from Reed Hoffman, uh, you know, saying, thank you for being a member for whatever. But that, 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 that's it. That said, you know, I've seen the iterations, right? I've seen everything, how it works. And I always respond to people when they respond to my content in some way. Um, I can often and usually tell when, when people are responding to me in order to, you know, involve me in their business in some way. I don't, I don't resent that. That's, that's the fuel that makes the platform go. But what I do resent is when my responses then should make it clear to the other person that I'm here for the relationship, not the business. And I always give folks the benefit of the doubt, but, you know, I, 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 I don't ever want to feel played right? I want to feel appreciated um, and understood, you know? So it's, so that, that's, again, it's, that's me, but like, I like this whole idea of building that relationship first based on something interesting and something important that you've said is, is, a, is I think a clearly decent way to go, right? But, but if I can yeah. say, it's, you, you've got a really good point here. It's so important to remember that people don't want to feel played and they don't want to feel like they're pressured or being pushed to a next stage or part of a process. And so it is everything to really tune in to this idea of if they came here, then let's just say hi and let's just say thanks. And just and that's why we use the words out of interest, what made you look at this? And that's that. And if they are forthcoming, then great. And if they're not, you know, if they elaborate and they're effusive, brilliant. That means they see you as open, uh, you know, and, and approachable. And they are showing this wonderful tell that they feel that, that you're probably someone they might be able to trust and believe in. If they don't, a chase, you now stepped over the line. Don't need to chase it. Like, hey, did you get this message earlier? There's 800 million people on there. Put some new content out, make it better, get more people coming at you instead. And rather than chasing this one person over and over again, there is enough to go around. So it's such an important point you're making, Dan. I think if you, you will know as an individual, you will know in your stomach before you're about to click on send, if that message is slightly overstepping the mark, if your eagerness or keenness to move the process along is in any way contributing here, you're doing it wrong. It sounds bad and it's against everything I was told when I was selling, but this is it. they are humans first before they're a prospect. So you treat them as, as such. It's really important. If you feel icky, it probably is. It's like, it's a very good rule of thumb. I mean, so, I mean, and I, and I am totally guilty, by the way, of, of having crossed that line in my past. Like I know that there was a period of time where I was trying to, to stand up my own business and I was chasing. And I was like, wait, this isn't working. Luckily, the other great thing about LinkedIn uh, and about any digital uh, uh, kind of tool that's available to you is this 
fast to fail, fast to fix. And, you know, I just kind of got this sense after a few weeks, like, okay, okay, I can't, I gotta stop. <laughs> I gotta stop. I'm going to ruin too many, too many relationships here. So, you know, it, 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 I'm still reluctant in some ways to, um, to go, to be too fast to make introductions and things like this, but, but I'll do it. And especially if I trust the people that I'm dealing with and I'm happy to make, uh, to make the commerce flow or to help the commerce flow on the platform. And, you know, I, and sometimes we get, we get caught up in our own bubble. So my perspective again, on, on any of the sales methodologies I see, any of the platform use methodologies is, is colored by you know, that thousands and thousands of hours of time understanding this business and this platform. So if I'm, if I'm the chief of the, the, the procurement officer for some particular organization, I will have a very different perspective than the one I'm explaining to you now. And, and it's hard to step out of your, your zone there. Um, yeah. you know, it's incredible. I, anyway, look, Richard, you, you have, I love your approach and I want to just be clear. I'd like to challenge things a little bit, but I, I, I think your, your approach is like as a breath of fresh air in a time when, you know, and fresh air meaning it's kind of weird when you say it's fresh air, but it's old school. It's actually the most human way to approach, but in its its uniqueness comes from the fact that prob I, I think you've got to agree with probably 90% of approaches are, are automated, a VA or templated at least. And it's because we're trying to be efficient and we're disregarding being effective. But I do want to pull on one thing you've said, because I think it's a really good takeaway for anyone listening. You said this earlier, it's not a simple case of you either get something or nothing happens. You either get something, sure, or you potentially irritate people and your reputation is a big deal. When you're sending connection notes out, if you send something that's a bit salesy and they ignore it, LinkedIn gives them an option that says, I don't know this person. IDK, the dreaded IDK. Yeah, you're building a case against yourself. And I remember this well, you know, it, if I go back to pre-LinkedIn, if I go all the way back to 2002 when I was like on the phones, um, I we got to a point where we changed our name, our company name, because there were people from the past, from the, the 90s, that had created such a bad reputation. You'd say, hi, it's Richard Moore from. You'd say the name of the company and the phone would go down. So there's also, you you, you know, if you if you are sending out these, these things that are irritating people, don't think that because they didn't respond, oh, it doesn't matter, I'll move on to the next one. You're also building a case that, that you're maybe not to be trusted. And word gets around. People love to, oh, yeah. uh, to share, like, don't, don't, don't worry about that guy, leave him alone. So it's a really important warning, but it mustn't paralyze people and stop them trying. People are forgiving enough, but just read the signs. Don't let the script dictate what's happening. Let the engagement dictate what's happening. Um, that's really crucial. I think that's so important. And you know, you're right. People are people. People are forgiving. And they're only forgiving, though, with authenticity and genuine behavior, genuine curiosity. And you know, when you make those connections with, with others, it has to be based in that, right? It has to be based on, their, on a reason. Um, and, you know, I think that's, that's great advice to think about moving forward. Now, I, I can't believe we've already hit an hour of our time, Richard. It's been such a fun conversation. There was so much <laughs> more I wanted to talk to you about too. But I, I, I think that uh, just, you know, to, to wrap this up, any last words for the listeners that, you know, I know you just gave a great amount of advice, but is there anything that you just to sum, to sum it all up uh, that you'd like our listeners to, to leave with? Yeah. And, and hopefully it's a thread that's gone through this talk and um, it might seem basic or obvious, but if it's obvious, it's often because it, it's a really good tip and it is that you should still try. I want you to try despite all the things. It, I don't want someone to hear all this and go, oh man, I'm worried I might put my foot in it. Or I might do this wrong. Although the theme here has been act, action, activity, doing it and getting on the pitch. Don't use books or courses too much as the excuse for not getting on the pitch. It may feel like it's relevant and it might be feeling like it's training you, but it, the term I use is it's positive procrastination. Mm -hmm. It all feels very relevant, but the truth is you're basically putting it off. Get, get out and try. You learn best by doing, and that's never, never going to change. And I think 
the upside of learning by doing is you actually get real life results rather than stim- simulated ones too. And I think that that's, that's, it needs to be that simple. Like that should lead you like try at least be trying and every single day. I love it. It's very Yoda, but it's also, uh, it's also very real. We learn by doing, you know, get out of our comfort zones, have that mindset where you're willing to attempt and to fail and understand that's not you. It's, it's, it is you if you don't iterate, but you have the opportunity to optimize, iterate and change and improve all the time. And you don't do that. You don't do that simply by book learning. You do that with practical, uh, practical experience. I love it. Books go out of date. Yeah. I mean, it's worth sharing. Like books go out they of do. date. They do. And, and, and what I would do a year ago, maybe slightly different. And then you've got to stay at the bleeding edge. And that means being live on the pitch. Fantastic. I think if anybody out there wants to be on the bleeding edge, you probably should be following Richard. I think this is uh this is probably my best advice to you today would be to go on LinkedIn, uh, look for Richard Moore. There's a lot of Richard Moores out there, uh, but look for Richard Moore, uh, the LinkedIn accelerator, uh, a client, a LinkedIn client accelerator, um, and as well as Entrepreneur Business Live. Uh, these are the sort of uh, keywords I think that that are in Richard's profile. Um, also, uh, if you click on Rich, if you if you you're not sure you got the right Richard Moore, click on his profile. There's a a little sound thing. He gives a little verbal intro. You'll recognize his voice if you've listened to this podcast, so you know you got the right guy. Um, also, check out um, therichardmore.com where you can find Richard and all all he's up to. Uh, And that's again, the Richard Moore and Moore has an E on the end for you, uh, for those of us who are in the States and don't often and sometimes forget that. And um, finally at, uh, on Twitter at Richard Moore UK, uh, at Richard Moore UK, all one, one, uh, one word, of course. Uh, Richard, this has been a tremendous, did I miss anything by the way? Was there any, um, any places? No, it's, it was, it's so thorough and I really enjoyed it. And there's been a, a, a really kind of, there's been a journey through. So I really appreciate you uh, taking the time to to kind of construct it this way. I really enjoyed myself as well. Uh, terrific. You. Feelings mutual. I've had a really great time with this conversation. I look forward to more. Thank you so much. I look forward to more and more. Thank you so much <laughs> for coming on the show. 